Hello and welcome to ILTV's TV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras and coming up in today's newscast, Israel remembers the late Major Bar Falah following his tragic death at the hands of Palestinian terrorists on Tuesday night. In other news, over 30,000 fans pack into Haifa's Sami Ofer Stadium for legendary battle between Israel and France. And finally, the history of Jews in America as told by The Stomach in an amazing new series. Israeli officials from top to bottom are eulogizing the late Major Bar Falah Zichrono Levacha after his death at the hands of two Palestinian terrorists late on Tuesday. Hundreds attending the funeral for IDF Major Bar Falah in Netanyahu Wednesday evening, less than 24 hours after his tragic death, and an outpouring of support and memorials flooding social media. The 30-year-old deputy commander of the Nachal Brigade's recon battalion remembered at the funeral by his friends and family as a hero who charged headfirst towards every duty or obligation in his position. From leading his unit through dangerous situations, including the Tel aviv Dizengoff Street terrorist attack earlier this year, to teaching his students how to surf and ski. <laughs> שנהרג הלילה בהתקלות עם מחבלים סמוך למעבר ג'למה. אנחנו שולחים את תנחומינו להוריו, לבת זוגו, למשפחתו ולחבריו. מייג'ר פלאח was killed when he and his team split into two to surprise a pair of suspects that had been discovered approaching the Gilboa checkpoint, the suspects slowly making their way into position and lying down. But the suspects were not yet known for sure to be armed until they opened fire, at which point Falah was mortally wounded. Falah and his unit still responding, killing the terrorists in the process and saving others from harm. Among the more heinous details to come out of the investigation, though, that the terrorists from the attack affiliated with Fatah, the leading faction in the West Bank led by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, and the PA among Palestinian terror groups praising the attackers as heroes and inciting to further violence. <laughs> So as part of Israel's response, IDF troops clashing with and arresting several suspects related to the shooters as they entered the attacker's hometown to map their houses for demolition. At least eight suspects arrested overnight. Additionally, Kogat halting all entry permits to Israel, including work permits for residents of the Kafir Dan area until further notice. And the security crossing at which the attack took place indefinitely ordered closed by security officials as well. Defense Minister Gantz sharing his condolences for Farah's family and friends and discussing how Israel will respond to such aggressions. And again, especially as one of the terrorists was a member of the Palestinian Authority's intelligence. Joining me with more on security, given the sharp escalation between Jerusalem and Ramallah, Former senior legal advisor to the IDF legal department, Lieutenant Colonel Reserves, David Benjamin. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, Lapid and Gantz and other officials are warning the Palestinian Authority that they need to control their territory and that Israel will not hesitate to attack any aggressor. But in, in, in this and several other cases this year, the PA and Fatah and the Fatah al-Aqsa martyrs brigades are the aggressors. Why aren't Israel and Prime Minister Lapid being a little bit more direct about that? Well, the fact of the matter is that the PA and Israel have a common interest. And in fact, I would say the interest is even stronger on the PA side. The arch enemy of the PA, or arch enemies, I should say, are Hamas and the Islamic Jihad organization. Israel is secondary when it comes to immediate threats. They know that Hamas are the ones who are going to throw them off the rooftops, or are they going to send them scurrying across the fields 
Okay, that's not, that's not a problem they're going to have with Israel. They know that deep down. They know that it's in their best interests to keep the security situation under control. Maybe from time to time, uh, you know, for polit internal political reasons, it can get out of hand. They, they, they can release uh, sometimes. But I think at the end of the day, it's a very, very clear interest for them. And obviously, it's a clear interest for us. So I, I do think that at the end of the day, given that that's the paradigm that was agreed upon under Oslo, and, and we don't have an immediate intention at least to change that by dismantling the well, but, PA or somehow moving into the territories, that, that, is the, that is the solution. But, Lieutenant Colonel, it's as from what, based off of what you've just described, it sounds like the Palestinian Authority has every uh, reasonable reason to, to, for lack of a better word coming to mind, appease Israel in a sense, uh, to keep the peace with Israel and to keep stability in the Palestinian Authority. But then what is Israel's incentive in not telling the PA in much stronger terms to, to do so? Because as we've seen over the last year, uh, and you can check in Palestinian Media Watch and several other uh, organizations, the Palestinian Authority is actively inciting to violence. Well, certainly Israel has to make it very clear uh, that what the Palestinian Authority doesn't do itself, then Israeli forces will, will have to accomplish themselves. And of course, that, that is happening in practice, unfortunately, right? It shouldn't be a day-to-day -day occurrence that, that idea of forces enter areas under Palestinian Authority control. But uh, it has to be clear that that's, that's, that's going to happen if the PA doesn't, so to speak, get its act together. Um, I don't think the PA has, has an interest in that happening. I think the PA's clear interest, rational interest, is to keep the situation under control. Again, rationality doesn't always dictate the order of the day in our, in our part of the world, but, but that would be the logic. All right. Now, another interesting thing that is that the Fatah-led Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades is a United States-trained security service. And while funding has tapered off in recent years, the United States and the PA security forces do still maintain some ties and coordinations. Should Jerusalem be directing some of its ire or, uh, towards Washington? I don't think ire towards Washington, but I, th I think we can certainly be asking Washington to come aboard to, to, to urge the PA again, to, to toe the line here and get, it, get its house in order, for sure. I think that there definitely would be scope for that. Maybe if the, if the PA won't listen to us, maybe they'll listen to Washington. All right, now all of this again leads me to a, a fairly fundamental question in a sense. Is Israel in any sense at war with entities in the Palestinian Authority? Is the PA, by virtue of their actions, at war with Israel? And based on that answer, how does that distinction define Israel's policy? Okay, well, I, I think we are in a state of armed conflict. Maybe let's leave the, the word war aside because it confuses us. But, but from a legal point of view, it's the same thing. We are in a situation of a simmering armed conflict, certainly with Hamas and his, uh, Islamic Jihad. Okay, that isn't the situation vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, the Palestinian Authority is, is kind of what, what, what's come to be known as a frenemy, uh, that we have a common interest in keeping the peace. Um, that, that situation, that definition of an armed conflict dictates what Israel can and cannot do in the military arena. And that's, uh, obviously the rules are very clear when it comes to Gaza. When missiles come out of Gaza, I think it's pretty clear we're in a militarized armed conflict and those, that would dictate the rules. In, uh, in Judea Samaria, it's more complicated. For, for the most part, the IDF role is, is more law enforcement, more cooperating with the Palestinians. But of course, there are pockets in which armed conflict situations in a localized sense can arise. Uh, so, so it is quite complicated legally, but uh, that's why we have so many lawyers today right. involved in analyzing this and advising well, the idea of what's, what's appropriate. Well, so again, what should Israel's next move be? Because clearly telling the PA to get its house in order is not working. Well. Um, look, I, I don't think we have a choice. I, don't, I, don't, I think obviously if the PA doesn't act, we have to act, right? I understand now there are tens, if not hundreds of uh, uh, warnings, uh, you know, live warnings every day about potential terrorist attacks. Right. Obviously we want the PA ideally to, to deal with those, but if they don't, Israel has to step in. I don't, right. I don't think it's an option. I think it's, it's, it's a necessity. Right. And hopefully the PA will come aboard and we need to put as much diplomatic pressure on the PA as possible. Perhaps not only via Washington, but there are other, other actors, perhaps in the context of the Abraham Accords, who would like to see a stable situation in our area, where, where they could, could, could bring pressure on the PA to, to, to act as it, as it should. 
All right, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much again for joining us. Moving on, an incredible and emotional roller coaster of a match between Israel's Maccabi Haifa and the French PSG. ILTV's Kayla Everlin reporting. A legendary matchup here in Haifa, some 30,500 fans packing into the semi of her stadium and hundreds of thousands more watching from home across the country to see Israel's Maccabi Haifa football team line up against Paris Saint-Germain, arguably the best team in the world, with athletes like Messi, Neymar and Mbappe. But for nearly 15 incredible minutes, Israel was in fact the best team in the world. Or at least, that's how it felt, as Maccabi led 1-0. Then, for the next hour, Maccabi and the PSG were practically head-to-head -head again, leaving Israelis clinging to the dream of the impossible, that they might still win at the UEFA Champions League group play. But then, as expected from the start, PSG taking the lead and finishing the match 3-0. Again though, Israeli Sport 5 capturing the feeling perfectly, saying the final score won't be remembered, but the 13 minutes where Israel was in the lead and the amazing minutes throughout the rest of the game will never be forgotten. Uh, nous avions évidemment analysé uh, le Maccabi, qui est une équipe qui est à la fois très bien organisée, uh, avec des joueurs de talent, avec beaucoup de jeux vertical. C'est une équipe qui a mis beaucoup d'intensité, mais comme elle l'avait fait aussi uh, contre Benfica lors de leur premier match, comme elle l'a fait sur les tours préliminaires en playoff. Euh, donc pas surpris, évidemment, avec une ambiance, avec, euh, devant son public, devant un stade qui était magnifique en termes d'ambiance. And now with more from the world of sports following the momentous match last night between Maccabi Haifa and France's PSG, editor-in-chief and writer for Baba Gol Sports News, Yossi Medina. Yossi, it's great to have you with us. So, you know, did you enjoy the game last night? Yes, it was a high-quality match, I think, no matter if you were a Maccabi Haifa fan or a fan of a football fan, actually, that wanted to see the best players in the world. It was one of the greatest matches, I think, that uh, we had in Israel in the last years. Wow. Uh, now, I, I know that Maccabi has had its ups and downs in the last few years on the world stage, uh, but how would you rate the team overall today? Uh, especially after Wednesday's performance? I think that Maccabi Haifa is still a bit far from the European highest levels, of course. It is clear in the late minutes where PSG was attacking continuously, while Maccabi Haifa couldn't handle them, them at all. But Maccabi Haifa came focused to, the, to that match and performed really, really well against such a great team. Uh, so I think that although they are, I would say, the weaker team in this group, they have chance to make troubles to any club, and that is <laughs> something ma really massive for Israeli football. All right. So, uh, what do you think is the biggest difference, really, then, between a team like Maccabi Haifa and, and the Euro League? What, uh, what would what would bridge the gap? I think it's mostly uh, depends on the, on the tactics, how courage you have in, on the field. Uh, Maccabi Haifa has a great tactician on the lines. Uh, Barak Baka has a long tradition of uh, making tremendous performances in European competitions against much stronger clubs. Uh, he has done it with Paul Beersheva against clubs like Inter. Um, so that, that is one thing. The other is of course the foreigners, the, the players from abroad that uh, strengthening the squad. Charon Chari who scored last night was great, really. He made an amazing uh, performance. Also other players like uh, Franzi Pierrot, the recently signing. Of course, Josh Cohen, although he is uh, Jewish and is considered as Israeli player, but he's American born and played until, I think, a few years ago in the U.S., mm. they are bringing something special to add more for the Israeli wow. players uh, in this kind of games. Amazing. All right, now I want to actually move topics a little bit uh, towards Qatar, which is slated to host the World Cup in a couple of months. Do you know how many Israelis are actually preparing to travel for the games? And, and what can you tell us of, about some of the preparations to receive them? I know, for example, that there have been talks to open a temporary Israeli mission. Yes, there are actually there are a lot of uh, estimations about how much Israelis will visit Qatar. 
I would say that it's even too soon to know because as long as you're getting closer to the World Cup, you hear about more and more people that are buying tickets, buying packages, uh, book their, ho their hotels. Uh, of course, it's the first time that Israelis could officially enter to Qatar uh, with no requirement of visa. We know that there is no diplomatic relations between the countries. Uh, Qatar said since the first day, since they uh, were granted the host of the World Cup, that they are open for Israeli tourists. They will do anything to make them feel safe in Qatar. Um, it will be a real challenge for everyone. We know the connection between Qatar and Iran and the uh, close distance between these countries. Uh, but Israelis are, I think, don't take it into account while they are buying more and more <laughs> packages and tickets to the matches. EOC, right, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. Now, when thinking of the story of America, we often think of the immigrant, wary travelers escaping some kind of persecution or just looking for a fresh start and a better life. And for American Jews, it's no different, which is something the Ruderman Family Foundation hopes to highlight with episode, episode one from its amazing new series, The Jewish Foodie. Jews and food. They seem to go together like peas in a pod, and in episode one of The Jewish Foodie, a new series by the Ruderman Family Foundation, we take a trip through Jewish history and culture in America via the most Jewish organ possible, the stomach. You ask why people come here, again, there's that connectiveness and, and nostalgic feeling. Starting in New York's famous Lower East Side, Israeli actor, comedian, and host Ori Lazarovich meets up with Paul Weissman from the Lower East Side Jewish Conservancy Organization. And together they head to three of the most iconic Jewish restaurants in the city, the historic Katz Deli, the Yona Schimmel Kanish Bakery, and the Russ and Daughters Bagel Shop, which to this day is run by members of Russ's family. Again, though, the mouth-watering episode is not just looking at the meals these eateries serve, but at the Jewish family dynasties that make them and the city of New York what they are. You know, it's so cool, but I think it's so cool. Yeah. Is that now it's not just a taste of Jewish America. It's just a taste of America. I love that for a lot of people, this is how they, this is their Jewish identity, this is their Jewish food. But for other people, they're, you know, we have visitors coming from all over the world. And for them, this is what New York tastes like. So join Ori from New York to Wyoming for this and other incredible episodes of The Jewish Foodie and get a real taste of what it means to eat like a Jew in the States. And now with more on The Jewish Foodie, Shira Ruderman from the Ruderman Family Foundation. Shira, it is great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Tell me a little bit more about this show and how it came about. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. So as you could see in the short video that we watched, um, we thought that this would be a nice way to engage with many, many more uh, people within the American Jewish community and of course the Israeli public to actually bring us together without uh, words, just with experience and good visual and by that, to get closer of understanding. I think that you heard in this um, little short video that most people and millions of people that visit New York do not know that many of the signature places that became American culture are actually Jewish, all started by Jewish immigrants. Um, how we came about it, we actually uh, owe the credit to a staff member of ours. Um, he is our content manager, Yudo Zavlo, that I uh, always thought that we should do something around food. We should bring the food to the center of the conversation. And we took his wonderful idea and started to develop it from one idea that was um, to bring the story of the food to bring a story of a Jewish community and history. And wow. the element of bringing a comedian like Ori that can make it funny and accessible right. and not heavy and historical and, and complex. It's more... Let's just enjoy it and see what we have in common. So, uh, so again, what are, what are you hoping uh, for the end goal uh, of this project? Uh, is it mostly entertainment with a little bit of, of revelation, like you said, or, or is there anything more? 
I would say two things. First of all, we did it a web series, not like before we did TV series, because we know that the young adults and the younger um, audience that we want to reach are, you know, searching good materials and content on the web. So we thought we can grow and enlarge the experience and the audience by that. The other thing is we showed different parts of America and the Jewish communities through the food. If it's from Texas to New York, so it's not just the big communities, the famous restaurants, it's actually what's behind the food that helps or brings the Jewish community to be part or unique part of their own state. Mm. So we are hoping that first of all, it will be a tool for many organizations that work with young adults, with colleges, with um, all Jewish streams, a tool of engagement, a tool of knowledge, a tool of communication, a tool that can strengthen the relationship between Israelis and the American Jewish community. So we hope that many uh, people will use it as a tool, wow. will find it as a way to connect. And um, we maybe can think about how to expand other parts of culture and American Jewish culture and make it accessible to the Israeli audience through this experience. So tell me a little, maybe a little bit more about the planning and the production process for a show like this. How do you go about choosing the eateries, for example, and, and what else uh, is the Ruderman Family Foundation maybe uh, working on in, uh, in, in the background? First of all, you need good partners in order to have a good result. And we were extremely lucky that the production company that we work with, which is the Nawi production company with Asaf Nawi, is just wonderful because you can dream with them, you can envision, and, and, and it's important because in order to make something short on the screen, there is so much footage you need to have. You need a team of researchers from our foundation team. I mentioned Yuda and Itai and Galia and his production team hours and countless of research, wow. talking to people on the ground, finding the good stories, making it diverse and interesting enough, bringing it together to a whole story that is, of course, supported by historic facts and by content people. So it takes tremendous amount of work wow. to be able to produce such a thing. We love and believe in the power of the screen. We love the screen because you can bring the visual and feelings and emotions, which is very hard sometimes to do in other ways. We believe in the power, TV screen, web screens, the entertainment. So we constantly think about new ideas. We thought about small communities a couple of years ago, from a synagogue's project, from wow. a third generation, Holocaust, anti-Semitism. So what we're working on these days is some interesting and hopefully groundbreaking um, researchers and white papers that will show the power of the web and its impact on some of our most important things, which is anti-Semitism in Israel. We're working on some other uh, TV series that uh, you know will be completely uh, different genre. Uh, and we're well, hoping that people yeah. will find it interesting, meaningful, and engaging. Well, I, I loved watching this and, and writing that piece, and it's mouthwatering and amazing. Shira, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Have a wonderful day. All right, now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected around the country tonight, with lows averaging 19 degrees Celsius or 66 Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow, the forecast calling for more clear and sunny skies, along with top temperatures of 36 Celsius or 96 degrees Fahrenheit. And finally, on Saturday, the weather remaining much the same, with temperatures ranging between the mid to the high 30s. That is all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all of your devices, check out our website, ILTV.TV, and subscribe to our newsletter, as well as to our streaming platform, ILTV+. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful weekend. It's Emmanuel Kadosh. I wanted to invite you all to subscribe to ILTV Plus, where you can find our daily news and updates about Israel. And not only that, but live feeds, entertainment, our kosher food show, and so much more. Needless to say, your subscription to ILTV Plus helps us grow and create more content while also supporting the state of Israel. Our app is available on all platforms and devices, so I'll see you guys there.